Good morning and Happy New Year. Good to see all of you here this morning. Our uh, passage this morning is 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Um, if you don't have a Bible, the ushers are going to come forward and um, just raise your hand and they'd be happy to give you a Bible. You can uh, use that today and if you don't have a Bible, we'd love to have you keep that also. So 1 John 2, 15 through 17. And turn, uh, turn with me to that and, and read along. It says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Let's open our time in prayer this morning. Father, we are grateful um, to be here this morning, to gather together as the people of God. Um, as we open your word, Lord, uh, we are so drawn to the world so often, Lord, and, and we want to uh, have the love of the world lessen in our lives and, and the love of God, the love of you increase in our lives. And so I pray that the Word of God this morning would penetrate our hearts and minds and, and transform us into that reality, Lord. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, back in uh, 1979, the great theologian Bob Dylan wrote a song called, Gotta Serve Somebody. And the lyrics of the chorus went like this. It was, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Yes, indeed. You're going to have to serve somebody. Well, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Now, I'm not sure if it was intentional. And actually, it probably likely wasn't intentional. But Dylan's song sort of patterned the message of the Apostle John in this letter of 1 John. As you read through the letter of 1 John, you'll see that there's, there's no neutrality in this letter. There, there's either light or darkness. There, there's righteousness and unrighteousness. There's life or death. There, there's followers of Christ, and there's Antichrist. Everybody's serving or worshiping something, either the God who is light or the kingdom of darkness. And so throughout the letter, John distinguishes between the genuine and the false, true believers and non-believers. There's sort of a matter-of-fact posture in John's letter. He's, he's very cut and dry. You want to know if you're a true believer? Well, that's easy. You, if you do this, you're a Christian. If you do this other thing over here, you're not a Christian. He doesn't mince words or, or speak in shades of gray. Throughout the letter, he's distinguishing between the genuine and the false, and he makes it clear that genuine faith is demonstrated by our way of life. Here's some examples. In, in chapter 1, he tells us that if you say you're a Christian and you walk in darkness, then you're a liar and don't practice the truth. In chapter 2, he tells us that real Christians keep his commandments, but false Christians don't keep his commandments. In chapter 3, he tells us that it's, it's evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. The children of God practice righteousness, and the children of the devil practice sinning. They love to sin. But what John is telling us in, in his letter is that our patterns of life give clear witness to who we're serving. And let, let me just repeat that. Our patterns of life give clear witness, or our way of life give clear witness to who we're serving and to whom we belong. Now, I want to just warn you uh, this morning, this sermon is going to weigh heavy on the law today. We're going to end with grace, but we're going to spend some time on the importance of the law to the gospel, the importance of obedience to God's authority, rule, and law as an integral part of the Christian way of life, as it serves as a gauge to measure the reality of our faith. One of my Bibles uh, says it well, there are, the notes in one of my Bibles uh, says it well, there are moral implications of gospel transformation. Well, our passage here in 1 John starts with one of these sort of gauge verses, if you will. Verse 15 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 
And so how do you know if your faith might not be genuine? Well, if you love the world, then your faith isn't genuine. So let's start here by looking at what John's talking about by the word world. And, and what is this world that we're told not to love? The Apostle John, throughout both his letters and his gospel, uses the, world, the word world frequently. Uh, the Greek word used in all of these cases is cosmos, which has a pretty broad definition and, and probably isn't going to necessarily help us narrow it down. And, and so we really need to understand the context in which John is using the word in order to fully understand the meaning of the word here in this passage. World in Scripture often refers to the totality of creation, the universe. It also sometimes refers to the world in, in more local terms, the, the literal physical earth, earth, the place that mankind inhabits and, and resides in. And then it also often refers to the world in terms of all that exists in the world, the physical aspects of life that we interact with on a day-to-day on -day basis. But I believe in this passage, the term world has a little bit different connotation. He, he's speaking of that which is rooted in the unregenerate, that which is rooted in the evil and brokenness of sin, that which opposes God. John Calvin, commenting on this passage, noted that by the world, we understand it to mean everything connected with the present life, apart from the kingdom of God and the hope of eternal life. So he, speaking of John here, includes in it corruptions of every kind and the abyss of all evils. In the world are pleasures, delights, and all those allurements by which man is captivated so as to withdraw himself from God. And in this passage itself actually is actually self-explanatory because it tells us how the world expresses itself. It expresses itself through the desires of the eyes the desires of the flesh, and the pride of life. Some translations use the word lust to describe the desires, the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. And it, and it says that those things are not from God. They're, they're from the world. They're from the kingdom of darkness. And so the world here, rather than simply encompassing the earth itself and, and what physically inhabits it, is really ta talking about that which is unregenerate, that which produces lust and pride that which draws us away from God, that from which all of the evil corruption of sin is revealed. It's the kingdom of darkness. And he brings this out in verse 16, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life. Let's take a look at some other passages that I think are going to help us see what, it, what is actually in the world and what he's talking about in the world. Colossians 2 Colossians chapter 3 says, Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Colossians 2.8 says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. And finally, Philippians 3.19 says, For many of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. So what are these earthly things, or the things that are of the world? Well, it's the unregenerate evil desires that distort and go against God's purposes. It's also the philosophies and, and the ideas and the false religions that stand in opposition to Christ. These all come from the world. The world in this passage is those things that oppose God and draw us away from Him. And that's why you can't love the world and love God at the same time. James 4.4 4 says, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Matthew Henry, commenting on this passage, says that the heart of man is narrow and cannot contain both. So the world, the, the earthly things, are, are rooted in the rebellious nature of the kingdom of darkness. It's, it's the realm that Satan rules. So how does the world express itself? 
This, this rebelliousness, how does, how does this rebelliousness express itself? Well, we read in verse 16 again this description of all that's in the world. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And so it expresses itself in these three categories where our distorted desires draw us away from God. There's, there's the flesh, what appeals to our physical senses. There's the eyes, what we can see and, and how we interact and relate with things outside of ourselves. And then there's pride, our, our personal sense of identity, how we understand and project ourselves to others. It's not intended to give us a detailed list of every sin that comes from the world, but rather the three broad categories by which sin expresses itself in fallen mankind. And the point John is making here in this letter is this. If you love these things, the love of the Father is not in you. The life of a true Christian is not characterized by these things. Well, let's start with the, the desires of the flesh. What are the desires of the flesh? Commentator John Gill described the desires of the flesh as being gluttony and drunkenness, excess of wine, rioting and revelings, and all the sensual pleasures of life by which the carnal mind and the lusts of it are gratified, whereby the soul is destroyed. And so the desires of the flesh here are those sensual desires that satisfy our physical being in ways that, God, that distort God's created purposes. The desires of the flesh would obviously include any form of sexual immorality, any form of sexual pursuit outside of God's prescribed context of a man and a woman living in, within the covenant bond of marriage, and that would include adultery and fornication and, and pornography and homosexuality. Sexual immorality is such a prominent theme in Scripture because of the, dis the destructive nature of it. It epitomizes rebellion against God. Now, I want to be careful here just to, about just coming up with a list of sins that fit under this category, but there are common things that many of us struggle with that have their origin in the world, the kingdom of darkness. What about gluttony, our relationship to food? We don't need a new diet for the new year. We need to bring our relationship to food under the lordship of Christ. How many of us did that over the holidays? I saw this meme the other day. It said, life is short. Eat the cookie. That's been kind of my philosophy for the past month, I think. God's blessed us with good and abundant food. Eating's a part of a Christian fellowship, and, and so we can feast with thankful hearts to God, but it can easily become excessive and indulging the flesh. What about what you put into your bodies? I, th I think of drugs or, or excessive use of alcohol. Our, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Does, does how we treat and take care of our bodies reflect that? What about sloth or, or laziness? Isn't that a desire of the flesh to be, to be sedentary most of your waking hours rather than working at something productive? Things like excessive gaming or just sitting uh, in, in having excessive screen time. Um, I could go on and on, but the, the point here is that the way of life for the Christian should not be characterized by indulging the desires of the flesh. It's important to no <clears throat> excuse me. It's important to note here that the flesh or body, in and of itself, isn't evil. God God created mankind with bodies meant to serve and and worship and image Him. We we need to be careful of a worldview that sees the physical world as bad and the spiritual world as good. That's not a Christian worldview. We're not only created as embodied souls, but in the new heaven and new earth, we'll have new perfected bodies, and, and we're going to live in a, in a physical world. So as Christians, we don't ignore or set aside the physical aspects of the world, including our own bodies. According to 2 Corinthians 10, Five and six, we take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience. And so the Christian duty is to take captive for Christ our relationship with the physical world. We bring the physical world, including our bodies, into subjection to the rule and reign of Christ. God created us for his purpose and his glory. How are we honoring and imaging God with our physical being 
and senses. We're either honoring God or we're distorting His will and purposes. There, there's no neutrality in this. Indulging the lust of the flesh is not the way of life for the Christian. So what about the, the desires of the eyes? In Matthew 6, and 23, Jesus says this, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Shakespeare said that the eyes are the windows to your soul. The desires of the eye is, is the seat from which we look out on the world around us and absorb what we see into our hearts, and we say to ourselves, I want it, and I'm not going to be satisfied until I get it. Instead of God being the source of contentment and happiness, what we see with our eyes becomes the source of our desires. I'd be content if I just had a bigger house or maybe a better car or whatever it is that, that you might be looking toward for contentment. It's the source of envy. We're looking out at others and observing what they have, and we're desiring those things for ourselves. What we absorb through the eyes influences our thinking and worldview. What we allow to enter into our minds and hearts through the eyes by way of TV and the internet and, and YouTube influences how we think. It influences our worldview. It, it can desensitize us to ideas and philosophies that are anti-Christ. We like to think of these things, television and movies, the internet are generally neutral entertainment, but they're, they're more often than not promoting a worldview that is anti-Christ. And if you're binging on these things and spending hours in, in, watching YouTube videos, your, your thinking and your worldview are being influenced, and oftentimes not in a good way. The expositor's commentary said this about what the eye is allowed to take in. It says, he who is outwardly the spectator of these things becomes inwardly the actor of them. The eye so to, is, so to speak, the burning glass of the soul it draws the rays from their evil brightness to a focus and may kindle a raging fire in the heart. That's why Job said in Job 31.1, I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze at a virgin? The, the curiosity of the eyes of men is, is bent towards sin. What we're allowing our eyes to see will eventually lead us to act out in our lives. Isaiah 33, 15, and 16 says, He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly, who despises the gain of oppression, who shakes his hands lest they hold a bribe, who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed and shuts his eyes from looking on evil, he will dwell on the heights. His place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. His bread will be given him. His water will be sure." He who shuts his eyes from looking on evil will dwell on the heights, and his place of defense will be the fortresses of rocks. Some of you may need to shut your eyes from looking on evil. You're allowing things to come into your home and into your mind and in your heart that are evil and opposed to Christ. They're from the world. They're from the kingdom of darkness. And John says very clearly, if you love the world... The love of the Father is not in you. We need to be like Job. We need to make a covenant with our eyes to not allow the things of this world that oppose God to kindle a raging fire within our hearts. Well, let's talk about the, the pride of life next. In Matthew 23, 6, Jesus speaking about the Pharisees said this, they do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor at feast and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by others. The pride of life deals with ambition and the, the ambition of honor and, and status. The, the pride of life is, is obsessed with how people think of you, how you're perceived. I think we would say in our day that the pride of life is obsessed with identity. 
That doesn't mean that ambition is a bad thing. There is a godly ambition that we should have. God has created as part of his image in us an ambition to work and to produce and to provide and to have dominion over the land, over the rest of creation on earth, and, and to create and build things that improve our lives, and improves your life and your family's life and the life of others. And this includes not just work, but arts and sciences and nature and, and all the spheres of life that allow us to flourish as image bearers of God. This is part of God's created order. Back in Genesis 128, he says to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. This is God's framework for meaning and purpose for mankind, to image God through, care, through the care and flourishing of his creation for the, the express purpose of glorifying God. So how does the pride of life distort these things? I remember in one of my classes, the, the professor told the story of a friend whose dad had just passed away, and the dad was, was very wealthy. He was a, a very significant philanthropist. And, and this friend was not a Christian, nor was the dad. And, and the friend, while giving the professor a, a tour of his home, um, was, was questioning why God would not allow his dad um, into heaven because of all the good things he had done. He, his, his dad had done so many good things in the world and given so much money and, uh, to good causes. And, and as they were talking about this, they came into a large room in, in the home where the dad and all of his accolades were on display. He had a whole room dedicated to, to all of the accolades and, and recognition for his philanthropy. They were on display for anyone visiting to see. And as they're walking through, the, the man seemed to realize that all of his dad's philanthropic actions were motivated by the recognition and accolades of others, how others perceived him and elevated his status in society. His dad had spent his life building a monument to himself. The pride of life takes what is to be subdued by us, to be used for the glory of God, and turns it into monuments for ourselves. Our houses, our property, our cars, our RVs, our stuff, our kids, our jobs, our hobbies, all these things can be good things, gifts from God, but they can easily be turned into monuments to ourselves. Our identity gets wrapped up in what we own, how we're perceived, who admires us, our status in society, how people are recognizing us, and why they should be recognizing us. What monuments to yourself are you building? Is your home a place to be used for God's glory? where the family worships God together, where you're shaping a Christian worldview in your children? Is it a place of Christian hospitality? Or is it a monument to yourself? What about things like ministry, even good things like ministry? If you were somehow taken out of the ministry that you have now, or, or maybe someone else is doing something that, that you think you should be doing, would you be crushed because your identity is wrapped up in these things rather than in Christ? The starting point of a Christian worldview is God, and our identity is found in how God perceives us in Christ, as clothed in the righteousness of Christ. The starting point for, for the pride of life is man, it's ourselves, and our identity is found in how others perceive us. How does this make me feel? How does this make me look in the eyes of others? How does this improve my standing or status? How does this affect my reputation? True believers love God, and their identity is rooted in the person and work of Jesus Christ on their behalf. Unbelievers love the world. They're characterized by the pride of life, an identity derived from others' perceptions of them. This is from the world, and it's rooted in rebellion against God. So the desires of the flesh, the, the desires of the eyes, the, 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 the lust of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and, and the pride of life are, are from the world. If we love these things, the love of the Father is not in us. 
So how do we know that we love God and not the world? Well, let's look at verse 17. It says, And the world is passing away with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Whoever does the will of God abides forever. So how do we know that we love God and not the world? Well, it says it right here, that those who love God do the will of God. You know you love God if you do God's will. And that kind of begs the question, well, what is God's will? How do I know the will of God? So many Christians are, are so confused about the will of God. They're, they're looking for some sort of sign. They, they see the will of God as this sort of mysterious thing out there they're always trying to reach for and, and can't quite ever get a hold of. Well, I'm going to boil it down for you right here and now, and I'm going to reveal to you this morning what the will of God is for your life. Are you ready? Here it is. Stop loving the world and obey God. That's God's will for your life in a nutshell. You're welcome. <laughs> I was able to give that to you. Put to death the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life, and live according to God's commands. That's God's will for your life. That's the Christian way of life. I heard R.C. Sproul tell the story one time of how he was teaching a, a first-year seminary class, and on the first day of class, he, he gave the class a quiz. And the quiz was simply to list the Ten Commandments. And, and he talks about how he was a little bit shocked that this group of aspiring pastors did not know the Ten Commandments. A couple of them knew a few of them, but no, nobody knew all of them, and most of them maybe knew one or two. And that was somewhat shocking to him. These, these, these men were aspiring to be pastors. How would you do if you took that quiz this morning? If we took it this morning, would you be able to list the Ten Commandments? Exodus 20 um, is where you find the Ten Commandments, and I would just recommend go memorize them. Teach them to your kids. Have them memorize them. John Calvin said that the will of God is first made known to us in the law. In other words, the will of God is, is rooted in the law of God. Doing the will of God and obedience to God go hand in hand. Going back again to verse 3 in chapter 2, and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. We, we tend to like grace, we love grace, and we should love grace. The grace of God is, is amazing. We sing about it, right, all the time. But obedience just doesn't sound as good. It seems kind of legalistic, right? But this passage is clear. Those who love God do the will of God. They love and keep His commandments. A grace that doesn't transform our way of life is no grace at all. With the expansion of the, the reform movement over the past couple of decades, many Christians have, have moved out of the, the fundamentalist legalism of the 20th century into a more gospel-centered faith that applies the, the gospel of grace to every area of life. And as somebody who grew up in fundamentalism, I'm glad, glad that's happened. I'm thankful for, for my, my growing up because I was taught the gospel. I came to Christ through that. But I'm also thankful that we've moved to more of a gospel-centered faith that applies the gospel to every area of life, a less legalistic way of life. But there's been a flip side to that for many, and that's been this disconnection of God's law from the gospel. There's this antinomian or, or anti-law impulse among Christians, even many in the reform movement. We love grace, but God's law, not so much. But the gospel involves both law and grace. The gospel includes the gift of the law. We, we tend to talk about law and grace in terms of law versus grace, or law or grace, as if they're dichotomous and we have to make this decision between one or the other. But it's not law versus grace. It's not law as Old Testament and grace as New Testament. In Matthew 5, 17 and 18, Jesus says this about the law, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one iota, not a dot, will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. 
In Matthew 22, 37 through 40, Jesus again talking about the law. And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Canadian theologian Joseph Boot describes the law as a mirror that shows us our condition. Back uh, a few years ago when I actually shaved every day, um, I would get up in the morning and, and I'd look in the mirror. And the mirror showed me my condition. I needed to clean up and, and shave. The mirror couldn't wash or shave me, but it showed me my need and it, and it, and it guided me through the process of shaving. Boot says this, the law is not the source of life, it is the way of life. The source of life is the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, the new covenant in the blood of Christ. The law is, is now being written onto our hearts, so it becomes our desire and delight. We're washed not by the law, we're washed by the blood of Christ so that we can live in obedience to the law. Some of you may be saying, well, I, I thought we were all about grace. No, we're, we're all about Christ and his gospel, which includes both the law and grace. The law drives us to the grace of God by exposing the depth of our sin and our utter inability to keep God's law. God's grace through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ rescues us from that sin and rebellion. And then it, it then empowers the Christian to love righteousness and to pursue the way of life for the true believer, as embodied in the law of God. This is the will of God. So how do we know that we're not loving the world, but we're safe in the love of God? Verse 17 again, whoever does the will of God abides forever. True believers have been transformed by the gospel of Christ through no effort of their own, by grace alone. And that transformation is conforming them into obedience to God's law. True believers delight in doing the will of God. We have been saved by grace and grace alone, not by the law. But true believers delight in doing the will of God. The true believer hates the world and the things that are in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the, the pride of life. We still get caught up in these things sometimes, though, don't we? We're still battling the old nature and the temptations of the world. And I, I think that word battling is, is really key there. I, I, if we love Christ, we're battling sin. Sin is not easy. Sin tears at us. If our faith is real, then we're, we're going to hate the sin that still besets us. It's going to tear at our souls and cause us to cry out to God to help us to overcome that sin. And if you hate the sin that still besets you, I think that's evidence of God's grace on your life. We know that we hate the world with its evil desires and, and pride of life when we do the will of God. Charles Spurgeon wrote, If we have received Christ himself in our inmost hearts, our new life will display its intimate acquaintance with him by a walk of faith in him. Walking implies action. Our Christian faith is not to be confined to our closet. Our belief must be revealed in our practices. Our way of life gives evidence of what we love and to whom we belong, God or the world. There, there's no neutral position here. The desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life are from the world. If your way of life demonstrates nothing of authentic Christianity, then by what standard are you calling yourself a Christian? And the last thing I want to do today is give you a false sense of assurance if the evidence says that you love the world. And I would just say that if, if that's you today, then I want to call you to repentance and to place your faith upon the sure work of Christ, who bore in his body on the cross the punishment that we deserved for our sins, and by whose righteousness we are justified and declared righteous by God. 
This transformation from death to life, from, from loving the world to loving God, is, is undeserved on our part. We don't deserve it. It's grace alone. It's, it's accomplished by the grace of God alone. And it is through this grace in Christ alone that we're able to put to death the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. And through the power of the Holy Spirit who regenerates our souls and writes the law of God on our hearts and conforms us to the Christian way of life. Let me conclude this morning uh, by going back to the Calvin quote I cited earlier, but this time I'm going to give the whole quote. He says, The will of God is, is first made known to us in the law. But as no one satisfies the law, no happiness can be hoped from it. But Christ comes to meet the despairing with new aid, who not only regenerates us by his spirit that we may obey God, but makes also that our endeavor, such as it is, should obtain the praise of perfect righteousness. Brothers and sisters, Christ has met our despair with new aid to love and obey God. It is in Christ alone that we can say no to the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life and walk in the blessed life of obedience to Christ, the way of life that marks a genuine follower of Christ. And so let's go into the new year, not with New Year's resolutions to, to lose weight or get in shape or save more money, as, as good as those things may be, but let's be a body of believers with a Holy Spirit-empowered resolve to forsake the world and to love God, to live the way of life that God has called us to as Christians. Let's pray. Father, we... We just uh, thank you for this truth in John. In many ways, it's a warning to examine our, our lives to see whether or not we're loving the world or loving you. And Lord, we desire to put these things away, the desires of the, the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. We want to put those things away. And we want to love you. And we want to be do your will. We want to be obedient to your word. You have put the law of God on our hearts, Lord, and uh, empower us with your spirit to live the way of life of a Christian. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.